the folks who are joining uh, the recording later. So um, hello from past uh, MLUX, we're gonna get started. Um, so uh, very quickly, I'm gonna do, I see that there's some new folks here. So I'm gonna just quickly go through kind of who we are and what we do here at MLUX, but then I'm gonna hand it over to Katie to talk about UX as a lover for ethics in AI design. I'm very excited. So um, hello, uh, welcome to our MLUX May event. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about UX as a lever for ethics and AI design. Um, really quickly, who are we? Um, you know, I'm the only one up here speaking right now, but we, this would not have been possible without all the folks behind the scenes who help make it happen. So, so nice to see folks in the chat, like Bob, like Amy, so many others. Um, so just thank you for volunteering and stepping up and, and making that possible. Um, so some of you, this might be your first MLUX event. Uh, welcome. We are so excited to have you. And you might be thinking, uh, machine learning and UX, those are very cool. Do those really go together? Um, we say yes. So how I like to think about it is, you know, how do we use data, data science techniques in order to inform and am I still here? Maybe, I don't know. My computer just did a refresh. You're back. You're back. back. Hey, what up? Uh, so how do we use data science techniques in order to drive and inform UX design decisions, but also how do we design better experiences to let our users know what's happening with their data, how they can control it, how they can give feedback. Um, and for anyone who's like brand new to the field and is like UX, I don't know what that is. It's short for user experience. Um, it could be UX design, but remember that is so much more than like pixels on a page. It could be UX research, um, really thinking about the overall experience. And then on the flip side, uh, the data, sorry for all the data scientists, I see some ML engineers and stuff joining. Uh, yeah, I'm just boiling it all down to one word data, um, but it's data science, it's artificial intelligence, data analysis, even stats. Um, how do those kind of all fit together and how do they feed off of each other as two disciplines? Um, so when they come together, they make really powerful experiences like this. This is one of my favorites, which is the Pinterest visual search as someone scrolling, they see something they like, they can tap in the lower right hand corner and like I don't need to know the machine learning behind that. It could be computer vision, it could be NLP, but you're basically streamlining the user experience and not make them go back up to the search and retype and articulate what they're trying to look for. Um, so this is one example of this, but we also have so many more. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll share this in the chat, but uh, we've written up a couple other like examples in uh, our latest Medium article or one of our latest Medium articles on what is ML and UX. Um, so cool, that's kind of what we're talking about when we talk about the domain, but you know, our vision and what we do is uh, we've been going for, oh my gosh, almost four years, a little over three years, three and a half years. Um, so our vision is to create a collaborative environment between UX, data science, and everyone in between, and really organize that community to foster cooperation, creativity, and learning. And we do that by hosting tech talks, um, panels, sharing best practices, um, like we're going to be doing today. And of course, sharing now on all of the social media platforms. Ooh, ah, so um, choose your, I don't know, social media of choice. We are on it probably. Um, so there's, oh, great. It just concatenated all of them. Fantastic. Um, but, you know, we're uh, actively trying to capture this um, information because it's not going to be like a single individual who creates the future of AI and UX. Um, it's going to be a bunch of different best practices and in different ways. And so how do we um, share out those learnings even for folks who can't be here now? So like, we are today, we're gonna to be recording this talk. So thank you to uh, Clara from Feminist AI for recording, really appreciate that. Um, but of course, uh, this cannot happen without you. So um, if you are at all interested in volunteering, about tweeting, about speaking, you have a really great example, um, feel free to reach out and contact us. We're humans at mluxsf.com. And, um, and we get recommendations all the time from really cool folks. Um, in fact, I saw Katie, I was co-speaking with Katie at an event and I was like, oh, your talk is so great. I'm sure folks would love it. So like, that's exactly how this happens. Um, and thank you, Katie, for your time for this. Um, and another big one too, is we wanted to shout out um, Feminist AI, our larger um, nonprofit. And so if you're interested, check out their gofundme.com slash feminist AI. They have a really great like promo video about like where your investment goes and stuff, but really it's it's helping reimagine AI for everybody. Um, and 
I do a bunch of like free programming tutorials and stuff um, online. So yeah, and there's so many other programmings like they did an algorithms of oppression book club. It's amazing. Um, so definitely check it out. Um, so anyways, without further ado, that's kind of who we are. And I'm going to hand it over to Katie. Um, Katie, I think are you able to present your screen? I do need permission from you, it oh, looks like, to share my I will, screen. I think I can do that. Oh, perfect. Um, well, we are so excited to have Katie here. She's an associate professor at University of Maryland High School, um, and she leads the Ethics and Values in Design Lab, which I'm really excited about because I feel like that's something that's talked a lot about in academia, but we don't really see a lot of it applied or like examples of it in um, industry. So, okay, I see that you have access. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Excellent. Is it showing properly? Does it all look good? Claire, can you see it? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much, Michelle, for inviting me. Um, and um, today I'm going to focus on the ways that I think this is like my dream job for UX professionals. So, uh, the way that I think US, UX professionals can be instrumental in um, privacy and fairness in AI, um, and particularly where I think folks can look for opportunities to build those values and to center them in design practices. Um, so as my title suggests, I'm going to be focusing on the sort of the how to, uh, the practice of human values like privacy and fairness within AI, um, and specifically the form of AI fueled by machine learning. Um, I'm going to talk about what I mean by AI and ML um, and the public reaction to AI and ML that's being broadly called the tech lash. I'll tell you a little bit about how I got interested in tech ethics at all. Um, and then I'm gonna spend some time talking about two ethics or values um, that I think are pretty critical to improving how we do AI. Uh, first up will be privacy. I'll talk about why privacy is a problem in AI and what we might do about it. Um, and then fairness, again, why it's a problem, what we might do about it. Um, and throughout, I'm gonna focus on the critical role of UX professionals and researchers in attending to both privacy and fairness. Okay, I probably don't need to introduce this group to the tech lash, but just in case, uh, there are now regular headlines and podcast episodes and even a major motion picture or a Netflix documentary um, about what are increasingly viewed as the ethical failings of big tech. Um, and I'm somebody who studied the tech industry for uh, over a decade. And while I think that a lot of this criticism lacks nuance, tech is a gigantic and super complex industry, there's no doubt that the tech industry broadly has struggled with whether and how to talk about its politics, its values, and its social obligations. Oh, and I'm gonna make sure my um, sound is sharing. There we go, because on the next slide, I have some sound. All right. So, um, for example, this is a clip from a 2017 Radio Lab episode called Breaking News that was, uh, that's about the invention of audio and video tools that recreate nearly perfect fake audio and increasingly nearly perfect fake video. So in this clip, you're going to hear a reporter interviewing a researcher in computer vision at the University of Washington who uh, has created a fake video tool. And uh, I am hoping you'll be able to hear this through the computer. Somebody come on and tell me if you can't in about 15 seconds. Like the timing of you guys making this thing and then this explosion of fake news, like how, how do you guys think about, about how it could be used for nefarious purposes? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, Again, you're a Kemmelmacher Schlitzerman. I feel like when every technology is developed, then there, there is this danger of uh, with our technology, you um, you can create fake videos and so on. Or I don't want to call it fake videos, but like to create video from audio, right? But they are uh, fake we, videos. We can, we can, yeah, yeah. But the way that I think about it is that like scientists are doing their job in showing, like inventing the technology and showing it off. And then we all need to like think about the next steps, obviously. I mean, people should work on that. So people should work on that, which great more jobs for me and my students, for iSchool students. Um, but in all seriousness, I think the implication that it's not her job to worry about so social implications of her technologies is troubling. Oh, sorry, always restarts instead of advancing. There we go. 
But that was 2017, that interview. And I actually think that matters um, because I credit AI and specifically the subsection of AI that's fueled by machine learning uh, using data about people with a lot of the recent attention that tech ethics is suddenly getting. Um, when I first began working in tech ethics, uh, which is about 2007, uh, <clears throat> oh, somebody's off mute. Um, Oh, no worries. <laughs> um, it was pretty common for technologists, for the people that I was studying, to claim that technology was a neutral tool, uh, that it was up to users to do good or bad things with it. Um, and this is a point of view that has been critiqued within technology studies for decades, um, but it was still really pervasive within very technical fields like software engineering. But increasingly, it is really rare to hear somebody claim that uh, technology or machine learning specifically is neutral or without human values. It's become increasingly clear that uh, AI and ML reify existing biases um, and disparities in the data that it's trained on and the data that it uses. Uh, and so there have been a number of really great books about exactly this topic. Um, algorithms of oppression was already mentioned. Automating inequality is excellent. Uh, race after technology. And as Rua Benjamin, author of Race After Technology, writes, existing social biases are reinforced, yes, but new methods of social control are produced as well. Whenever we hear the promises of tech being extolled, our antennae should pop up to question what all that hype about better, faster, fairer, might be hiding and making us ignore. And when bias and inequality come to light, lack of intention to harm is not a viable alibi. So how do we avoid crises of inattention, um, of producing new forms of social control and inequality, uh, particularly when we didn't mean to? Um, this is a question I've been trying to answer my entire career. Um, I didn't set out to work in tech ethics. Um, I started a master's program uh, to be an archivist and work with paper records. Um, I had this dream of working in the top of a library someplace and nobody would ever talk to me. Uh, but along the way, I got uh, involved with a group of faculty and this was at UCLA and the sort of mid 2000s. Um, and they, this group of faculty were asking questions about memory, not just memory, which was my interest as an archivist, but also about forgetting. They realized that as more and more is being recorded about us, uh, there might be negative social ramifications of all this data. Um, and at that time, I was lucky enough to join a research center at UCLA called SENS, which stood for the Center for Embedded Network Sensing. It's a mouthful, but SENS leaders were some of the first uh, in computer science to use mobile phones to collect data about people. Um, this was before the era of smartphones, just shortly before. Um, and the image there on the right is actually the setup that SENS was using, um, in, in, which is a GPS device um, manually taped to a Nokia feature phone. Um, and not shown, but in that bag is the huge battery pack that was required to power this rig for an entire day. Um, it was a, a very rudimentary setup, but it was one of the first to record people's locations using their phone. And so SENS, this lab, became the setting for my dissertation work. I did um, a participant observation study using anthropological methods to study how SENS engineers grappled with the ethics of the data collections they were performing. Um, so that's grad school me, which you can tell by the boot cut jeans, um, although those are coming back. Um, but you, I was helping out here with a design workshop. Um, and next to me is an air quality monitoring device. So they were building all kinds of monitoring devices. Cell phones were just some of them, but there were lots of other and from this ethnography of sensing engineers came an organizing concept that has shaped a lot of my work going forward, the idea of values levers. Values levers are work practices, things that you do, um, or design practices that surface ethical issues within technical work and make particular human values relevant to technical work. These are aha moments when ethical issues become relevant to design. Um, and the idea being that technical work can often sort of bulldoze over the social or the socio-technical, um, but there are moments in design when the social becomes really relevant and finding those and amplifying those has been um, a huge part of my work. So examples are things like interpreting policy for design. And this doesn't have to be like 
big federal policy like G or international policy like GDPR or something like that, although of course that is now relevant, but at the time there was nothing like that. Instead, it could be things like we were at a university. So the engineers had to deal with IRB requirements. IRBs are internal review boards that um, review um, human subjects research. And they had to try and figure out is what we're doing human subjects research? Do I need to apply for an IRB? Um, and those moments would surface values and values tensions. They would start to say, is what we're doing okay? Is this creepy? Should we not do this? Should we not do this in bathrooms or locker rooms? Things like that. Um, and so the developers had to negotiate design decisions in order to satisfy policies. Um, another thing we saw was that engaging with users would frequently surface human values. That's going to surprise literally none of you as UX professionals. Um, and so anybody who's done uh, user-centered design, participatory design knows that uh, human values become surfaced through these interactions with users. Um, there are also particular design methods that are designed to surface human values. Um, the envisioning cards, which are uh, come from the University of Washington, uh, design fictions, design noir. Uh, Richmond Wong, who's here today, has, has worked with and designed some of these. Um, these can all be effective values levers. So with my students at the University of Maryland now, um, I've formed the Ethics and Values in Design Lab, EVID, to uh, try to guide technology design so that human values are as much a part of the process as values like speed and efficiency. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about values levers in different software, enge uh, software engineering contexts that I've studied um, and that some of my students have studied. Um, I'm gonna talk about mobile application design and machine learning data curation, uh, because I think that they're helpful for thinking through where we might find structural interventions in our own workplaces to introduce uh, uh, ethics conversations uh, directly wherever we work. And I just want to say the point of values levers is that it doesn't rely on a single individual to do good design, to be the nag who says, no, no, we can't do this. But instead, it sets up workplaces and teams to encourage those conversations. Okay, so what do values levers look like in practice? Uh, I studied a variety of technology work settings, um, embedded sensing, like I mentioned, I've studied network architects um, to try and understand where they happen and when. Um, so an example, like with my collaborator, Dan Green, I studied levers that encourage privacy discussions in mobile application development. Uh, privacy is one of the first values that tends to surface when people start talking about uh, the big data that fuels mobile applications and machine learning. Uh, companies like Clearview AI, which is a facial recognition startup, have been accused of having, quote, nightmare privacy policies. Um, recent attempts at contract tracing, we have somebody here who worked on contract tracing, um, have been made trickier by privacy concerns. Um, and the, the public is generally feeling gun shy about privacy with pretty good reason. It's become clear how much of our data um, is, is tracked and shared. Um, so what do we do about it? I was really interested in how mobile application developers are grappling with this question because mobile app developers have a lot of leverage to make ethical decisions about what data to collect through their apps, how long to keep it, and how and whether to share it or sell it. Um, so I became really curious about sort of when and how they talk and debate about that power. Um, so for our study, we turned to two online forums where mobile app developers gather, iPhone Dev, SDK, and XDA. Um, iPhone Dev SDK is um, a smaller forum for I, uh, iOS developers. Um, we chose it because it was independent from Apple. Um, it's the largest iOS forum not run by Apple. And then XDA is a gigantic forum for um, Android developers and users. And um, similarly, we chose it for its popularity and its independence from Google. And the method we used to analyze threads in these forums um, was called critical discourse analysis. And critical discourse analysis analyzes the way that people talk about their practices. So we were looking for how they talk about what they do. And in particular, it puts an emphasis, uh, an emphasis on analyzing power and agency, asking questions about how people justify and legitimize their practices, so what they do. So what we were interested in is what are developers doing about privacy, and then how do they justify those decisions? Why do they think it's the right thing to do? We sampled for th threads talking about privacy, um, and then we looked for patterns and themes, including how the developers talked about users, um, the kinds of data under discussion, and discussions about their decisions to collect, retain, and share data. 
And what we found with us was that for iOS developers, navigating Apple's App Store approval process was the single most common trigger for data discussions by a lot. So here we have this theme of policy again, right? But this time it's App Store policy that's making the difference. Developers would write in to get de advice from their peers whenever their app was rejected from the App Store um, or when they got frustrated or they had trouble interpreting Apple's policies. Um, we also saw the power of Apple's regulations in their technical constraints. Um, it would frequently happen that an iOS developer would want to collect some kind of data and they wouldn't be able to access it and get things like they would want the camera taking pictures in the background without the user knowing. And this was physically impossible to pull off on an Apple device. Um, and so uh, again, you would see developers writing in and saying, why can't I do this? What's going on here? And other people would explain, oh, it's because of privacy. Um, and so Android developer, uh, but interestingly, that was in the Apple ecosystem. Android developers at the time didn't face the same policy constraints around data collection imposed by Apple. And overall, we saw far less discussion among developers of privacy. Um, however, uh, they, there were data ethics discussions and privacy discussions in the uh, Google forums, um, but they were frequently triggered by user concerns. Um, users were much more of a presence on the XDA um, sites because in the open source community, developers tend to be users and users are developers. Um, and so uh, there was much more give and take between users and uh, developers. And users would request new data protection features of particular developers. They would critique the permissions a particular app required. Um, and in response, you would see developers implement more restrictive data practices. Okay, so what might these patterns mean for UX professionals who are interested in increasing the space for privacy discussions in their work? First, I think UX professionals can be really attentive to the policies that surround data collection in your context. Um, so, of course, you can look for the increasing number of federal and state laws that might apply to data collection in your context. But I think maybe more interestingly and more impactfully, you can scaffold design in their setting with organizational policy, what I refer to as little p policy, requiring things like privacy impact assessments for particular forms of data collection might be an example. This could be local policy, um, but it can be really impactful for creating these debates around socio-technical um, issues and human values issues. Second, I think it's worth thinking a bit about the technical constraints in your ecosystem or in, in the infrastructures that you're working in. Is there something your team wants to do that is technically difficult, a kind of data they want to collect that's very hard to collect? And if so, are there social or socio-technical reasons that might be the case? You know, example I'd like to give is that the sort of, um, uh, what's the word, uh, you know, the, there's a real desire for, uh, to figure out, for app developers to figure out what we put in our mouths, right? Uh, what we actually eat, because then they could give us better calorie counting apps or uh, better apps to manage uh, diabetes and things like that. But it's a, that's a, almost an extremely hard form of data to collect. Instead, we have all of these stand-ins for that data, right? We could take pictures of our food or we could take pictures of the nutrition labels of the, of the foods that we eat, right? But those are, those are not great representations of what we actually eat. Um, and it's worth asking, are there more than technical reasons for why this data is so hard to collect? Should we be collecting this data at all? Are there social reasons why this data is hard to collect? Collect. Um, lastly, I think you can do something that you're already very expert in, which is incorporating the voices and concerns of users into design. The more we can do that, the more we get a broad diversity of voices in the design process, the more likely human values are to surface and share space with technical values. Okay, let's shift away from privacy to a second human values issue very salient to AI, fairness. So a range of examples from the last five years, um, plus some really important academic work, have highlighted the ways in which AI learns bias and discrimination from the data that fuels it. Parole algorithms, automatic image cropping, learning chatbots, HR tools, ad delivery, and image search have all been impacted by the use of historical data, which had historical biases built in. So for example, Amazon had a recruiting tool that learned to discriminate against people who had women's colleges and women's social organizations on their resumes because it was trained on resumes uh, that the company already had received for software engineering positions. And those resumes had historically come from men. 
So how do we encourage the kind of reflection that on the reflection on data and the context of data that spotting and mitigating that kind of bias requires. I have a doctoral student, Karen Boyd, who's now a postdoc at the University of Michigan, and she worked on this very question for her dissertation. In particular, she was interested in how machine learning engineers grappled with bias in training data sets that they didn't create. So training data sets that they were inheriting and trying to work, um, make something workable out of. Data sharing is pretty common in machine learning. And a group of researchers have proposed that training data sets that are shared should come with data sheets. This is Gruber et al. here, this citation. Um, and data sheets are a document which specifies the data's motivation, composition, collection process, and recommended users, uh, uses. And the authors make a really nice analogy to the spec sheets that accompany electronic devices or device components. So Karen uh, conducted a think aloud study in which she gave ML engineers a problematic data set. Um, she gave them a, uh, a set of images of faces that appeared, if you browse the data, to be overwhelmingly white and male. And in addition, um, the images, it was marked that the images had been taken without explicit consent of the people that they represented. She then gave all of her participants um, a toy problem to solve with that data. They were supposed to build a facial recognition system for a national chain of jewelry stores as part of their loss prevention efforts. Half of her participants were then also given a data sheet that described the motivation, the composition, the collection process, and recommended uses of the data. What she found was that data sheets helped trigger recognition of ethical issues and signal that ethics was relevant to the task at hand. So of the participants that had the data sheet, the vast majority mentioned ethical issues in the data sheet unprompted without her having to ask or bring them up. Uh, while the ML engineers without data sheets recognized at least one ethical issue when directly prompted during a follow-up interview, most of the engineers with the data sheet um, who read it, there was one engineer who didn't read the data sheet that they had, um, but everyone who read it identified one or more ethical issues on their own um, during their talk aloud part and tied it into their technical work as they talked aloud. So they tried to do something about it or considered it. And in addition, the data sheets particularly supported engineers in something that Karen calls particularization, figuring out what to do about an ethical issue once you've spotted it. For example, this quote comes from a participant as they actively read the context document and recognize the demographics of the data would likely reflect the demographics of the platform the data were taken from. So they said, okay, where's it from? Where does it come from? Photo bucket, okay. So whatever the demographics are for photo bucket, that's what I can inspect in here, expect in here. So they're trying to process you know, what this might mean. Uh, they recognize that the data might have biases, later saying that could introduce errors in the data, biases. So using context documents is a pretty concrete values lever for engineers to spot and problem solve around ethical issues. Sorry, my kids just got home and they're shouting in the background. I don't know if my mic will pick it up, but enjoy toddler shouting. <laughs> so uh, UX professionals who are interested in building space for ethics and values into design practices can, of course, encourage the um, adoption and adaptation of context documents for training data in your environment. But I actually think the implications of context documents as values levers goes even farther when we think about UX for ML. UX professionals and researchers are experts in context. Um, a deep understanding of context of data collection and use enables you to surface ethics, to make ethical principles visible on design teams, to relate ethics, to interpret ethical principles as design relevant, like this is something we should care about, and to practice values, to think about places to concretize human values in actions and process and in policy. So my takeaway recommendation for you tonight um, is uh, ABC, because it's really a cool mom joke here, always be contexting. Um, we know that ML is never just a technical problem. It's a socio-technical one. And UX professionals are particularly well-trained and well-positioned to bring that socio-expertise to ML projects. So this might include bringing the policy environments, both big P and little p, um, that the project will launch into. Um, this might also include spotting real-world constraints that will make deployment difficult or problematic. 
And this might include increasing user representation and design to ensure that user voices and concerns aren't forgotten. Um, and finally, I think it might include being attuned to bias in training data, or at least helping data scientists start conversations about potential biases. So Sarita Amrut has a really nice term. She talks about attunement uh, to talk about how technical workers uh, can be increasingly considerate of the ways that their technologies uh, play out in networks of power and marginality. Oh no, there's so much yelling. <laughs> Well, luckily, this is the end. Um, I'm, I'm going to end here with my project website and my email address in case you'd like to follow up. Um, and I would love to take questions as you can stand the toddler noise in the background. So I will leave my, um, should I leave my screen up or should I lower my screen so that we can see each other? Oh, I will, I will take it over okay. so that way we can then see um, your face but blown up. And so if you want to turn off your camera too, you're invited to. Um, oh my gosh, what a great talk. Yay. Thank you, Katie. Oh my gosh. Also, no worries at all. We definitely, I definitely could not hear anything in the background. Oh, good. So. I'm so glad. That was <laughs> quite loud on my end. Oh, not, no, it sounds That's great. That's why I have a mic. <laughs> yeah, it's just a bunch of knowledge drops. Uh, and uh, we're very grateful for that. And and also, I wanted to give a big shout out for Amy Turner, who actually was taking screenshots and then slacking them to me. So we were live tweeting. So Katie, good news. You have a bunch of tags when you sign back on Twitter, um, just because those examples were fantastic. Um, so yes, so uh, we're going to move into the q and I want to give a big shout out to Richmond, Dan, Carol, all y'all who have been kind of uh, having side comments and stuff too in, in the chat. And please feel free to put your, your questions in chat. But um, one of the, the biggest ones that I, I kind of wanted to ask you, Katie, is like, we have a lot of folks here who are like UXers, ML engineers, people who make stuff in like product-based stuff, how can they practice? Like what would be like your thing, your takeaway kind of recommendation for folks to practice um, uh, ethics and value sensitive in design? Yeah, um, I really do think it's sort of complex human contexts, right? It's that yeah. knowledge, it's, and that's a skill, right? It's not sort of always immediately obvious how, and there's a lot of discussion right this, about this in the sort of tech ethics world right now, like how are we supposed to anticipate uses of our technology? Um, and the sort of ethicist answer is, okay, right. We don't expect you to anticipate all potential harmful uses, but we do expect you to anticipate some of them because some are fairly obvious if you start looking at say the biases in the training data set that you used right or but you just have to know to do that you have to know to do that check right you have to know to think about the fact that people are going to be more sensitive about collecting data in some contexts and less so in others right um, and so those kind that kind of wisdom I mean it really is a ethical practice um, it just takes practice to sort of be able to make those connections between um, you know a banking data set and particular kinds of privacy concerns or particular kinds of fairness concern you know are, are certain people going to be able to get loans or not right um, mm. because there's a history there so and we and it, it takes a certain kind of knowledge to connect that history to present day data um, so that kind of contextual wisdom where you're always thinking a little bit about like what social structures does this play into or what historical structures does this play into? It's something that we're trying to teach more and more in programs like iSchools, um, but that I, that I honestly think UX people are uh, intuitively quite good at because of how much time you've had to spend thinking about, you know, perhaps individual user experiences. And now we're talking about group user experiences, right? It's one level out, but um, I, I, you know, I, I'm so hopeful for the ability of UX to just you know, be the people on the ground doing doing this initial work. <laughs> Saying, hey, we should pay attention to this. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and it, it can be a little bit tricky and kind of getting into um, Rico's question about like, you know, it's hard when it's not part of your job description, right? Um, so, so Mariko asks, um, what are your tips for getting wider organizational buy-in for tech ethics, especially when the processes may, maybe to other stakeholders seem like they slow things down. It's just another kind of like, uh, what is it like a privacy check? It's just like another box that they have to check for shipping a product. Like, what would you say for that? Yeah. Um, so they almost always do slow things down and that's <laughs> like a, painful truth, but it's also one of, you know, good design slows things down too frequently, right? So again, UX folks are not, not, um, 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not inexperienced at being the slow, like it's slowing things down sometimes, right? So wait, 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 this needs to be accessible, right? And actually I take um, a lot of lessons from the accessibility community because the accessibility community has been doing this for 20 years saying, no, 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 you can't ship that, right? <laughs> like that needs to be accessible. Um, and so that kind of, um, I like, I, I think that we're in a place now where things like privacy and fairness are carrying, starting to carry the weight with leadership that accessibility has for a while um, because there have been a bunch of disasters. And like, mm -hmm. you know, when I started this work 10 years ago, I was hopeful that we could re-steer the ship of the tech industry without big disasters, right? Just through yeah. like good work yeah. and good people. Um, and it, you know, I wasn't fast enough or I wasn't powerful enough. I mean, like there's, and there's a lot of us doing this work and we were, it was, a, there were disasters. <laughs> and now, but people are paying attention now, right? Uh, leadership is paying attention. That said, what I realize that what I'm asking is an incredibly hard thing. I have a, a, a wonderful colleague, Jake Metcalf, who has done a study of um, the, he calls them ethics owners. They're the people who have been hired into the sort of biggest tech firms to own uh, the work of ethical design. And it's an almost impossible job. Um, they're, they are struggling. He did anonymous um, interviews with them. Um, he and Dana Boyd and Manny Moss. Um, there's a really nice paper I can point you to that describes their experience. But you know, they they are um, they, there are no clear deliverables for their positions. What does it look like to like be an ethics owner and be successful at ethics, right? Like it, it, it's very hard to know what should go on your um, your sort of annual uh, reports. Um, it's uh, it's you're essentially being asked to slow the company down, to grind, to put a little wedge in the wheel of capitalism, and that's not an easy thing to ask anyone to do. We we worry about asking our students to do it, right? We're training them to think about these things, and then we're sending them out into a world where, let's be honest, <laughs> uh, wow. things have to move quickly, and that um, that's really hard. That said, um, we've seen lots of industries sort of reform themselves over time. Um, and you know they didn't used to put airbags in cars either, right? <laughs> um, and and now we have airbags and seatbelts. And there's a combination of sort of factors at work: social pressure, um, legislation has to be part of this, and I honestly is going to be right. We're already starting to see algorithmic fairness um, legislation that's you know demanding uh, uh, audits um, of data before you know decision making systems are put into use. Um, mm -hmm. We're I'm certainly going to see privacy legislation, although it's unclear what it will look like here in the US, although we have some in California and Maryland that companies are starting to have to respond to. Um, so, you know, there, this happens from both directions. There's big structural change that is imperfect. Um, and then there's sort of work from um, the inside out. And we, we hope that they join together to sort of create a better industry over time. But yeah, I realize it's like a lot easier to tell you to do this in academia than it is inside of these, inside of certain companies. Some companies do this really, you know, um, from from the beginning, um, and yeah. some don't. For sure. Well, I mean, and the, your point to accessibility, like uh, I believe it's Section 508 and the ADA, and That's right. kind of like yes. uh, like what we're seeing with like GDPR. I, um, I believe Mariko pointed out GDPR, CPPA, like all that stuff too. Like we're starting to see those kind of come up and like uh, that kind of reaction stuff too. And I think that's a great example of um, in your slides when you talked about big P policy uh, into little P policy and all that stuff too. Um, awesome. Also want to give a big shout out to all the folks in the chat who are sharing like, hey, here's some tips and tricks and stuff that uh, have worked for them. Um, but I wanted to move on to another question from Peter. Uh, uh, I work in clinical testing applications with ML features. Any advice for building trust with users of the system in terms of data accuracy, patient privacy, uh, and reliability in the life science space? That's one that we definitely get a lot. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, this is a great question. Um, I mean, this is one of those places where users is a broad category. And so my best advice is to sort of start, and I have to say, I'm not um, this, I'm not an expert at sort of building trust with the users. Um, and uh, so there are people who are gonna do this better, uh, sort of advise you on this better than me. That said, um, my instinct is that because, you know, we have sort of structural challenges to trust in science um, in the US right now, that 
uh, you are up against something hard, but there are absolutely ways to build trust with small groups first. Um, and so thinking about sort of who your initial group of target users are um, and working with them to show them, you know, well, what about this? Does this seem, you know, like legible to you and transparent to you? And do you, what else do you need to know more about? But then thinking a little bit about the demographics of the group that you have chosen to be your sort of um, starter users and where groups might differ on this. Um, so, you know, women who haven't been like have been left out, systematically left out of life science studies for uh, hundreds of years uh, may not be as initially trusting, right? That's a sort of a broad, a broad strokes example. Um, but sort of incorporating those, those power analyses, the thinking a little bit about power as you start to think about who your user groups are um, that you're building trust with. And then, you know, working in the great tradition of UX, of, of user study, of, you know, um, uh, contextual inquiry studies where you, you know, are sitting down and watching them use the system and watching to see what they cue in on and what they don't notice um, and how you might make those features more transparent to them um, and and working up from there is is my best advice yeah that's awesome and um yeah thank you i know it's like here hello here's a domain that you might not be an expert in but I, it's something that you know a lot of us are are you know we join these companies and then all of a sudden we have to be a domain expert in this kind of thing so your your perspective is really appreciated um on that note too i wanted to circle back to to one of dan's questions around um you had mentioned like there there are other fields like you mentioned accessibility that we can look to for inspiration um dan is interested in uh if People have run into barriers for um, in more for-profit or corporate settings versus like nonprofit for like, are there like certain industries where maybe this is more adopted and what those have been, what has worked, what didn't, do you have any like, um, I don't know, anecdotes from sure all of, of it, you have a lot of really great stories. So <laughs> that's, a, I would actually love to see comparative data on industries where this like, well, so so I have some hunches, but I don't have the data. Um, but I do. But so I one hunch that I have, and I haven't chased this down, but is that um, the uh, there's sort of more and more tech for mental health, and this you know, in, in sort of apps for mental health, and that um, and also increasingly AI uh, for mental health, and those companies frequently are founded by clinicians, people who have a background in treat in mental health treatment. Um, and it appears to me that there is a different culture in those spaces um, because they are coming, because the leaders are coming from a context in which patient privacy is paramount, um, in which patient-centered results are the important things, in which they have long had sort of disciplinary expertise in dealing with, for instance, systemic trauma and, um, uh, and you know, histories of oppression. Um, so I'm very interested in those kinds, in those industries, right? Industries that are tech-based, app-based, but where leaders come from um, a disciplinary space in which these conversations are just more normalized, um, if they will in fact have different work cultures. Um, I don't have any data that they do, and I haven't been able to figure out how to get inside so that I can find out, um, but I, I would be curious. So yeah, medical tech, uh, but specifically mental health tech, because folks are often trained up um, as social workers or as mental health professionals in those spaces. I'd also right. love to see sort of comparative work between the US and, and Europe and Asia, because these are things that vary internationally. Um, and tech cultures, and there's, you know, Lily Arani has like really amazing comparative uh, or work on um, entrepreneurial cultures in India. Um, I think we need sort of more work about um, the different, uh, you know, different like the U.S. tech sector is just one tech sector, and it's quite influential, and it's it's where I've uh, been, you know, focusing my interest. But um, you know, more comparative work internationally would would I think really help um, figure out you know how we can influence entire industries. Um, because yeah, see, you know, in the context of GDPR, like how much, you know, are European companies doing really different things or are they just, you know, pushing their lawyers against it and right. trying to <laughs> keep up with the Americans? I, you know, I don't know, but we could find okay. out. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. And um, I want to acknowledge you there. Are one, uh, Katie, you brought in some heavy hitters. Like we're getting questions from Richmond Wong and Jen King. So, hey, y'all. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I, I do want to ask Jen's question, though. Um, I might not get to all the questions. I guess that's what I want to say is like, oh my God, you guys, these questions are great. Um, but I really want to ask uh, Jen's question around, um, 
Uh, I think what's happening in the dark patterns slash manipulative design space is an interesting preview to what we might see legislatively with AI. But one of the issues I've encountered in thinking around um, non-manipulative, non-coercive design is that so much of HCI focuses on values around usability that are much more around reliability, efficacy, um, efficiency. And those concepts probably come out uh, of ergonomics and, and not really the best interests of the users, or maybe even more relevantly, the best interests of society. Society. Any suggestions on how HCI broadens the focus uh, away from what we traditionally think of uh, usability? And um, that's something that I'm going to summarize the Carol Smith also plus one. Um. <laughs> Oh, that's such a good point. <laughs> so because my, ex my experience in HCI has been so focused within the sort of participatory design end of things, um, which is a subsector, and, and Jen is absolutely right that that sort of predominant theoretical traditions within at least a good chunk of HCI are from the sort of ergonomic space and, and usability spaces. Uh, but that word usability has, of course, been super complicated by um, work, you know, within the like sort of Norwegian school of participatory design, right, which was really about labor activism um, or, um, you know, uh, work um, in critical design, uh, which you see a lot of in the HCI space these days. So that question of sort of, yeah, the foundations of a field and the ways that its values are, are sort of held up um, and then taught and then used in the field um, is a really, really good one. And I don't know that I have a total answer on like when and where particular HCI values have become dominant and how we might push back on them um, within design, you know, making usability a more complex notion of usability um, or, you know, not just a sort of, sort of an ergonomic one. But I do think, I mean, I do think that the, the big data era also cues us to think more broadly because, um, you know, usability is clumped to mean like, a, for instance, a global usability. So I'm so distracted by my yelling children. <laughs> I'm so glad you can't hear them, but no who can I? <laughs> working from home is such a joy all. Um, but um, yeah, so so this sort of found yeah these these foundations of values in the field. I tend to think of this field as having um, a very sort of human centric um, set of values. But it's a good reminder that that's that's not universally the case, right? Uh, and um, yeah, Jen, I'm not sure I've totally answered your question, but I'm going to leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, that was a big one, but it is definitely something where um, that's something that I've been thinking a lot about uh, as well about like, well, you know, how do these kind of feed off of each other and um, Carol kind of built off about that a little bit more, but really it's a lot about like, oh, you know, what are the frames that we're kind of using in the vocab? Anyways, I, I want to be sure that we wrap this up because I feel like we could um, chat for hours about this and I want to be respectful of everyone's time because we, a lot of us have small children uh, running around and it is such a time. Can't be the um, only one, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, but Katie, I wanted to wrap up. I know that you you gave us one best practice, which is ABC, always be contacting, um, which I feel like I should like hashtag that or something. Um, but you know, there's a lot of folks here who are actually in industry and also a testament to how interesting this conversation is. I feel like 90% of the people who have, have stayed on after the talk as well, just to hear the discussion. Um, what would be like one thing that you want us to like take back to like, our teams tomorrow. Like when we have our team stand up, we're all just like too excited about this talk. And we're like, oh, wait, 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 I saw this really cool talk. And here's like the one thing that I want you to know about it. Um, instead of giving our status updates, like what do you want us to say? I think that, you know, you, <laughs> as judging by this group and, you know, um, and the folks who stayed and didn't hate this talk, like you're not, uh, an island, right? You're not alone. You're not, your interest in these, you know, the world is interested in tech ethics all of a sudden, right? And that is, and so, and if you are too, then like, even though it doesn't feel, it's not the most important thing at work tomorrow, it definitely is not going to be, um, unless you're in a very special workplace, like you're not alone. There's a group of people out there trying to figure out how to do this and, you know, how to build a tech industry that is exciting and productive and also, um, you know, takes human values at it, its center um, and that, yeah, let's keep working on it together. Like let's find each other um, and talk to each other and figure out how to, how to do it. 
Oh my gosh, that is so great. I love it. Um, well, on that note, actually, I would love to to give us five minutes to try to, to meet other folks, but I, I would love to first, can we give uh, Katie a virtual round of applause? Put yay or something in the chat. I don't really know. Yay, thank you, Katie. This is awesome. Um, plus 100 that you are not alone. And I think that just, you know, showing up and seeing all these other folks is a testament to that. And I truly hope that, you know, our, our meetups have changed where you're not meeting folks in person, but I hope that you get a chance to, to at least see a cool name and you get to connect with them or share your LinkedIn. I don't know, follow up with coffee. Um, on that note too, I wanted to also just thank again, um, Clara from Feminist AI for hosting us on your Zoom, um, as well as, you know, kind of being our larger parent organization. So every time you donate, like all of our events are free. So that way anyone, regardless of where they are in their career or wherever they are, they can come. But when you do donate, it actually goes directly back to Feminist AI, our larger nonprofit. So in case folks are wondering, and that goes to supporting more community funding or community Programming. Um, last thing, uh, we have an upcoming MLUX event. Um, we already have it booked for June. Um, so did you guys know the pair guidebook, the People Plus AI Research Guidebook just relaunched and has a bunch of new uh, design guidelines? Oh my gosh, so cool. So we're gonna hear from uh, Thryn from Google Photos and she's gonna share how she actually applies them because that's a big one. Um, but yeah, on that note, I just wanted to say thank you, Katie. Um, thank you for your time and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Uh, you are the best. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Michelle. Um, you, this is such a service, uh, you and the whole organizing group. Um, what a service to this community. So thank you for putting it together oh and keeping God. it going. So cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, and we can stop the recording if anyone wants to come off um, whatever, uh, mute and turn on your camera. Um, but Katie, I hope that you see too that you got a lot of applause. I know it's a little bit weird virtually, but um, it's great. Yeah. And I can see the popping chat section. I can't wait to read it all. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of uh, positive accolades like, yay, thank you, Katie. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any other questions or wants to hop on, say hi, pitch a project. I don't know. This is your chance. You have a captive audience. Will the recording be available, Dan? Yes, it will. Um, yeah, the technical thing is that someone has to email it to me. Thanks, Clara. So then I'll probably put it up in like a day or two. Um, yeah, can Clara, do you, could you turn off the recording? Sure, yes.